This is the SF Productions Podcast Network. Schlock visionary William Castle. From the Pop Culture Bunker, I'm Mindy. And I'm Mark. You can check out our audio podcast, How I Got My Wife to Read Comics, on iTunes or on our website, sfpodcastnetwork.com. We're starting a new series on the show covering classic purveyors of what is called schlock cinema. Films made on the cheap for maximum profit and minimal effort. Mark really likes these movies. I do. And we're starting with William Castle, the king of gimmicks. His early years are rather depressing, losing both parents by age 11 and then living with his older sister. He saw the film Dracula at age 13 and decided his life direction was to make horror movies. But first, he spent a few years in theater, having dropped out of school at age 15. He managed to get Orson Welles to lease him a Connecticut theater, and then hired a German actress. Then learned that rules at the time required that German-born actors only perform in German plays. It was right around World War II. The solution? He wrote a German play, then translated it into English. Nazi Germany happened to invite the actress to a performance in Munich, and turned her refusal into his first gimmick. A fake telegram with the refusal was linked to the papers. Then Castle called the actress the girl who said no to Hitler. He then secretly vandalized his own theater with swastikas, making patriotic Americans want to go to the show even more. By his early 20s, Castle went to Hollywood to direct B pictures for Columbia. And there he got a reputation to bring movies in on time and under budget, which was very important, especially. That's probably with, the most important thing. Especially with B pictures. By 1947, he was an associate producer on Orson Welles' The Lady from Shanghai. By the 50s, Castle went independent, doing the horror movies he always wanted to do. In order to get people in the seats, he came up with bizarre stunts announced in the trailers many times by Castle himself, who saw himself as another Hitchcock. Macabre in 1958, Castle mortgaged his own home in order to make the picture then arranged with Lloyds of London for insurance policies for all audience members. $1,000 would be paid if they died of fright watching the movie. Clauses were in place for heart conditions and suicide, and nurses were on standby in the theater. Castle arrived at the premiere in a coffin. Audiences were also asked not to reveal the climax of the movie to others. The first spoiler? He would make $5 million at the box office, a tidy sum for a tiny independent film. House on Haunted Hill, 1959, starring Vincent Price, and made at a cost of $200,000, the film made $1.5 million. The big gimmick was Emergo! Not exactly 3D, but a plastic skeleton with glowing red eyes that would fly above audiences on a wire at some theaters. Hitchcock was so impressed with the film, he decided to make his own low-budget horror flick, Psycho. The film was remade twice in the 90s and in the aughts, with another remake underway and a prequel penned by Castle's daughter. The Tingler in 1959, filmed in Percepto. Again, just a gimmick. At one point, audiences watch a film within the film, and an audience member in the theater, a paid plant, screams and faints. She's taken away on a stretcher, also an act, and Vincent Price on screen mentions the lady who fainted and asks the audience to sit back down. The film then appears to break, and the titular monster is somehow let loose on the audience. The film and the lights go out, and we hear Price say, Ladies and gentlemen, please do not panic, but scream! Scream for your lives! The tingler is loose in this theater. At that point, small motors, surplus plane de-icers from World War II, attached to some of the seats go off, shaking the audience member, and pandemonium ensues. <laughs> Price then says that the tingler has been paralyzed, the danger is over, and the film resumes. Just an incredible example of showmanship. And such an interactive thing for yeah. that time. It's uh -huh. incredible. 13 Ghosts, 1960. This film introduced Illusiono. An actual visual effect of the film, but still a gimmick. <laughs> the film was shot in black and white, but the scenes involving the ghosts were shot with a blue tint, while the ghost had a red tint. Audience members were handed both blue and red eye filters. The brave ones used the red filters to see the ghosts, while the rest could use the blue filters and avoid them. But anyone watching without a filter still saw the ghosts. Homicidal, 
1961. Back to pure showmanship, the film included a fright break near the climax. A 45-second halt to the film, at which point audience members too frightened to see the ending could go to the coward's corner. A yellow cardboard booth in the theater, complete with nurse holding a blood pressure cuff. They would then hand in a coward certificate and sign it, stating they were a bona fide coward, at which point their ticket price would be refunded. Of course, they had to do this in front of the whole audience, following yellow lights and footsteps, while a recording said, Watch the chicken! Watch him shiver in coward's corner! <laughs> Virtually no one would go through this, so paid plans had to be hired to do it. A trailer for the film had Castle explaining all this and warning the viewer not to reveal the ending to friends, or they will kill you if they don't. I will. Mr. Sardonicus, 1961. I recently saw this on Svengoolie on MeTV, actually the inspiration for this episode. Audience members were given cards with glow-in-the-dark ink, showing a thumbs up at one end and a thumbs down at the other. Near the end of the film, Castle comes on screen and explains that the cards are for the punishment pole. Should the villain get his comeuppance, no matter how horrible it would be, or should he get mercy? The audience would hold up the cards, depending on their answer, and Castle would count their responses. He goes on about, you in the third row, can you hold yours up higher? And uh, that couple over there, fifth row, are you, are you voting as one person or two? <laughs> he then tells the projectionist to play the proper reel based on the poll. Of course, only the thumbs down ending was ever shown, or apparently ever shot. <laughs> Thirteen Frightened Girls in 1963. Castle created a campaign to find the prettiest girl in 13 countries. He then shot 13 slightly different versions of the film with the winners to be shown in their home countries. Some were not actually from foreign countries, but, well... Straight Jacket, 1964. Castle was pushed by financial backers to stop gimmicks this time in a horror film starring Joan Crawford. Of course, he couldn't help himself and handed out little cardboard axes to the audience. And the Columbia logo at the start of the film, you know, the torch-bearing woman, is decapitated with her head laying at her feet. I saw what you did in 1965. Another Joan Crawford vehicle involving teenage girls who do prank phone calls. Plans to promote the film using giant plastic telephones was given the kibosh by Ma Bell. So Castle made plans to add seat belts to certain rows of the theater so that patrons would not be jolted out of their seats by fright. It never actually made it to the showings. Rosemary's Baby, 1968. Castle saw a huge potential in the yet-to-be-published novel, so he bought the film rights in advance. Unfortunately, Paramount was not interested in him actually directing the film, so he's the producer only with no gimmicks to be found. Mm. Castle had kidney failure soon after the film's release, and he only did a few B pictures after that, and only one with a gimmick, if you can call it that. Bug, in 1975, a horror film about cockroaches, was publicized with a million-dollar insurance policy for the star. Hercules, the cockroach. William Castle passed away in 1977. John Goodman played a character based on Castle in the film Matinee, 1993, much of which is about film gimmicks. A documentary on his career, Spine Tingler, the William Castle story, came out in 2007. John Waters would call Castle God, and then go on to play him in the Betty and Joan season of FX's Feud. Robert Zemeckis considered Castle to be his favorite filmmaker, and formed a production company solely for the purpose of remaking his films. And has he remade them? Yeah, yeah, several of them several are from his production. Yeah, movie. yeah. Maybe you'll have to go look for those. Oh yeah, they're probably not nearly as good. Yeah. In the meantime... You guys can check out our audio podcast, How I Got My Wife to Read Comics, on iTunes or on our website, sfpodcastnetwork.com. From the Pop Culture Bunker, I'm Mindy. And I'm Mark. Thanks for watching. Coming at ya! Woo! -hoo 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 -hoo!